I'm Scott Lucas. This is World Unfiltered. In the Western press, there are many labels for President Erdogan of Turkey. Some of them are quite simplistic. I've seen him referred to as an Islamist, whatever that means. Others have referred to him as a secular leader, whatever that means, who use Islam to establish its power. Others have a representation of Turkey as a country which is in flux, sometimes caught between different rival camps. I have to say that quite often, I'm not quite sure exactly what the reality is behind this. So I was struck when I read a book published last month called Religion, Identity, and Power by uh, Dr. Erdi Oztürk, that he engages with these questions in a very rich way, because in fact, he's bringing together three different things. Of course, there is the question of this man who has been the leader of Turkey at the top for almost 20 years, and his Justice and Development Party, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. But then there's the question of Turkey beyond its borders in the region. And for example, its influence, historic and contemporary, in the Balkans. Again, too often a region reduced to simplifications in the West, far, far away, prone quite often to conflict. And then the third factor, and a feature of this book, is religion as power, religion as influence and projection. So this is no longer just a story of politics and the military and even diplomacy. It is a tribute to this book that it brings all this together, which is why Roland Filter welcomes Dr. Erdi Osterk. Let's see, fellow, Marie Curie fellow at Coventry University in the UK and the German Institute of Global and Area Studies, associate professor at London Metropolitan University in Politics and International Relations, and the author of numerous publications beyond religion, identity, and power. Erdi, thank you so much for coming on and uh, enlightening me today. Thank you, Scott, for having me. I definitely humbled uh, with your very generous introduction. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> well, let's get started with, I guess, sort of the background to set this up, because I think for many people, many of our viewers, the concept of the relationship between Turkey and the Balkans may not be something that's familiar to them, even though we can go back to the time of the Ottoman Empire to talk about its roots. What are the significant features the historical features of the Turkey-Balkans relationship that should really animate us today when we look at the two regions, two areas? I mean, before I started my Balkan adventure, I thought that, yes, they've been sharing the same history. The Balkan people, Balkan nations, different components in the Balkans and the contemporary Turkey. But what I realized that they're not sharing the same history, actually. I mean, I know it's a huge discussion, huge academic discussion, but they've been sharing the same past and they've been reading history quite differently. Different components of the Balkans, reading the different situations, critical junctions, turning points of the Ottoman history, of their own history, quite differently. So their histories are quite different, but they have been sharing uh, same past. But I mean, let me talk about a little bit about this old background of my work on religion, identity, and power. I mean, actually my work, my study, is a kind of a product of a personal experience, or I would say that it's a kind of a, to be stopped late. I mean, after many personal issues, I started to live in Libya in late 2014. And this story has begun actually. Uh, well, even though I, I wouldn't consider Libya as a classical Balkan capital, but you can smell every single taste of the Balkans, thanks to the migrants from all over the Balkans, Bosnia, Serbia, North Macedonia, Albania, Bulgaria, Kosovo. And I realized that. All of these Balkan originated migrants in Ljubljana have been following Turkey, Turkish news, politics, and culture very close. And they, they have very different, variety feelings about Turkey. And they commonly underline one particular point, which is regarding Turkey's very influential, multi dimensional role in the region. And actually, they told me many times when I had the chance to talk with them, Turkey is back. But what kind of back is that? So in the in the book, I'm just like shameless self-promotion here. Within this book, I scrutinize the Turkey's journey in the Balkans. And I looked, I tried to look at which factors are quite influential to understand Turkey's Balkan visions. This was my primary main aim. But then I realized that after 
four and a half years field work, I realized that I'm not the person who can write a book about the Balkans. Maybe I'm not the person who can write about the, a, a, a book about the contemporary Turkey, but three different factors, religion, identity, and power is very influential, is very important. And all of these three different concepts is interlocked in each other. And they've been very big effects in the Turkey's Balkan relations. And what I try to do that, I try to read the Turkey's increasing involvement and activism, seeking to uncover the role of religion, power ident power oriented identity reflections in the Balkans within the new millennium. Therefore, this book mainly eliminates the aspect of Turkey's different relations with it is Balkan neighbors in the context of broader shift in domestic and foreign policy under, under the very changeable, very diverse political faces of the AKP regime. And what I argued that it is there is a transformation within the Turkish domestic politics. And this transformation is not only religion oriented, but the religion has been playing a significant role. And this role has been changing Turkey's state identity and power components. And this transformation getting very different reactions from the Balkans. I think where is very suitable to scrutinize that kind of transformations because you know there is a different hierarchies between Balkan countries and Turkey. There is a common past, common religion, common culture, even common language in some of the regions of the Balkans. So I found that it is quite interesting to scrutinize religion, identity, and power-oriented transformation, one single particular country and its reflection on the Balkans. So what I would say that at the end of the day, this is not a Balkan book. This is not a Turkey originated Turkey book. This is a religion, a religion and global politics book that only taking Turkey and the Balkans as a country cases, as a battle, as a as a uh, as a, a ground testing area. Before getting into the Turkish dimension of that, which I think you've opened up for us, let me start with this Balkan scene, however, which you saw from Slovenia, you saw it from Bulgaria, from North Macedonia, from Albania. I got the impression here that there's a double-edged experience of Turkey here, that we have many people in these areas who either express Turkish identity or at least an affinity for Turkish identity. Yet at the same time, there's a historical past of at the very least being left behind, if not betrayed by Turkey. Is that a fair summary of that type of almost paradox in identity in the Balkan, in, for some it's, in the Balkans? Exactly, it is a great definition. And I prefer to use the ambivalence of Turkey's image. What is this ambivalence? Actually, I mean, Turkey, not, it is not a unique case actually, like many countries all around the world is gradually from withdrawing from an international cooperation and it is restoring to a new distinction between civilization by synthesizing nationalism with a very nostalgic and subjective vision of history, memory and religion. Indeed, we do not have any question about that stuff. This transformation has been evaluating under the control of Erdogan and his unofficial coalition partners. They were Gulen movements. Right now, we know that they were Islamists, nationalists, Eurasianists. And in a way, they've been trying to transform Turkey's big ship from another direction. And this transformation has been creating a different ideas, different reactions from the elites and the ordinary Balkan people. I mean, even though some underline that Turkey has been getting stronger independent, visible, and being a game changer while increasingly addressing the both global and also the regional, the Balkan audiences. But at the end of the day in the book, I'm rejecting this idea since from my observation, the transformation of Turkey's state identity under Erdogan's rule <clears throat> have been undoubtedly creating a jargoning effect and religion has been playing one of the dominant roles within this process. And it is obvious that the Turkish case, the reconciliation and the instrumentalization of Sunni Islam, but very subjective reading of Sunni Islam and nationalism with Erdogan's right-wing populism and not reactive, not preactive, but aggressive foreign policy strategies have creating different tensions in the countries. And this, this, this has been changing the Turkish, Turkish image in the region. But as you underline at the very beginning of your uh, remarks, 
you said, I mean, Turkey is a coin and it has two different sides. And it's quite about the your personal positionality. I'm speaking about the Balkan people to see which Turkey you want to see. So there are many different Turkeys, but at the end of the day, there are two main Turkeys in the region. And it is very much based on social, political power of the individuals and the countries. They've been while they were observing or explaining or scrutinizing Turkey's reactions in the Balkans. Okay, so let's talk about religion then, you know, with and the way that it is being projected by Turkey or mobilized almost in there. I mean, how is this process occurring? Is it occurring through the mosque? Is it occurring through foundations? Is it through simply the statements of leaders like Erdogan that put a religious overlay on this? Because I'm struck by the fact, of course, the Turkish Republic started with an explicit rejection of religion as the base of the state. It was supposed to be the secular state, or I think like, as you I, refer yeah. to it quite often in the book. So how is religion being projected and negotiated by Turkey in the Balkans? Let me take you a little bit through the corridors of history, if you don't mind. I mean, this separation of religion and mosque or church in Anatolia, it's the biggest lie that the some of the political scientists and historians claim that. What we know that from many different scholars and historians, starting from the Byzantine Empire period and then the Ottoman Empire and within the contemporary Turkish history, there is no separation between religion and politics. There is instead, there is a management of religion by state on behalf of society. This is it. because what we know that there has been always one institution in Byzantine Empire period, Ottoman Empire period, and in Turkey, there is a Dianet. They've been regulating, controlling, and many managing religious affairs for state. That means that actually religion is a tool for state. There is no separation. There is only management, regulation, and control. And I mean, if we talk, if if you can understand uh, laiklik, like, so therefore I am, I insist in the book to use the term of laiklik, like, not secularism, because if we talk about secularism, we've been talking about something different. But the laic like is not like that. If you are a laic like country, likewise Turkey, you should use your religious power in different ways. If you can define themselves as a modest or, I mean, modest, not harmful country, Muslim majority country, using religion apparatuses all around the world, that is fine. This is a kind of a management using and controlling religion. And right now, Erdogan, without changing any institutional structure, the institutional structures are exactly the same structures that founded by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk is the founder of the Turkish late. Now everyone using all of these institutions in a different way. So this is the first point. So there is no separation. There is no laic or there, uh, there is no secular identity. There, Turkey was a laic identity, but this laic like, has also different shapes. In the Balkans, I mean, it is a tough question because Justice and Development Party governments or right now with the Alatuka presidential system, it's the justice and or Erdogan's regime, where it is informal and unofficial, unconventional coalition partners, is a giant hegemonic power regime. So this regime using three different types of resources to implement religious oriented foreign policy. The first one is that, the first one, transnational state apparatus. This transnational state apparatus, the the first one is the, the majority, the most visible one is Presidency of Religious Affairs, the Annette. The other ones is Pika, Unisembre institutions, all other transnational state approaches acting as not only the religious tool or long arm, long arm of Erdogan, but also they've been working in their specific areas, but all of them putting a little bit of a Sunni Islam source, all of these, their activities. The second one is the religious communities. What I'm saying that these religious communities, I mean, the Gulen movement, you know, the controversial double-sided parapolitical institution has been the, one of the active, one of the active structure, Turkey originated structure in the region. And they worked very, very closely. I mean, you, you read a couple of interviews, like many interview quotes, not a couple of interview quotes from them in the book. I mean, they worked very closely with Justice and Development Party with their governments until 2000, roughly 13, roughly 14. And other 
Sunni Islamic communities. If I'm not mistaken, I noted them on the book. There are 36 different Islamic communities in Turkey, and at least 10 of them is very active in the streets of the Balkans. And they, they have very good and close relations with some of the Muslim components in the region. And the third one, Erdogan itself. I mean, whenever he, whenever I visited Sanjak region in Serbia or North Macedonia, I smell that Erdogan is not an international country's leader. Erdogan is also I wouldn't I wouldn't want to use that term, but someone symbolically holding the flag of Islam to support their interests all around the world. Erdogan is that guy. For example, there was a story in the book. I had a chance to talk the owner of the pizza shop in Albania, Druze. The name of the pizza shop is Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and the and the owner of the owner of the shop is Wahabi. And I, I mean, I went to that shop and I talked with the owner after eating a couple of slices of pizza. They were delicious, obviously. And I asked them, why did you put the name of Erdogan? Uh, I mean, you are coming from a different sect. Your your country origin is different. Your religious practices your understanding should be different and he, he told me that you know my friends not my friend i'm sorry you know my brother because you know my name is ahmed erdostur and being an ahmed Öztürk in the balkans is a fascinating active fascinating opportunity for a researcher anyway uh he told me that erdogan has been holding the flag of islam with we're with wearing the western style of clothes and talking every single non-muslim gabur leaders all around the world he is supporting our rights not all of, not the others erdogan is the only true person and i mean whenever erdogan visit the sanjak region which is very illiberal repressive and hegemonic leader of serbia saying that that i know in this region you like this gentleman more than me because he is someone for you quite special so the third factor is erdogan he is the open face and a public face of the transformed turkey in the balkans this is obvious so let's talk about first prime minister and president erdogan in fact before that mayor erdogan mm -hmm. in the 1990s in the 1990s, he is his political career starts as part of a religious party, uh, as mayor of Istanbul. In 2018, so 25 years later, he is proclaiming to Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, that he is a Muslim president. To what extent does Erdogan have this religious identity, or is he simply a power politician who is using and actually manipulating religion just to gain advantage, whether at home or abroad? I think this is the trick. And the answer is both. I mean, uh, when, like for the book, I read a lot about Erdogan's like personal story. And also I had the chance to conduct some interviews about Erdogan's friends. And Erdogan, I think is, or was a true believer. And his believing style of, Islam is very much shaped by Najib Fazl, is very much shaped by Najmettin Erbakan, so on and so forth. So he was a true believer and he was one of the, I mean, the young leaders who shouted in the streets of Islam before the you know, pan-Islamism or pan-Islamism. And he was the uh, young leader who sat on the same table with Erbakan during the negotiation processes in, the, in, in, in late 1980s and early 1990s with Muslim Brotherhood. This is the same Erdogan, but the same Erdogan is also a very pragmatic political actor. And with, with an Aristotelian terminology, he is a definitely a political animal. He is very pragmatic. He knows how to play the real politics. If you, if you consider all of the political actors all around the world, he and Joe Biden would be the most experienced political leaders all, ar all around the world. He is 80, he's 68 years old and he has been in politics uh, since he was 16 or 15. So he's, he knows every single stage of politics. So in this regard, he, know, he, he very well knows that 
Islam or religion is a glue for some societies. And the Balkans is definitely one of them because he has been working very close Balkan originated Turkey citizens. Sabri Demir is one of the uh, advisors. He was born in Albania. He can speak like more than, like, he can speak every single Balkan language, Balkan language. He knows the region and his relationship is not starting in his prime, prime minister pro process. He was he has very close relationship when he was the head of the welfare party in Istanbul and during his mayorship at the same time. So he knows the real needs of the Balkans. Therefore, I mean, what I would say that he on the one hand, he can see on the one side of the coin, he's been seeing himself as the leader of the global Ummah, and therefore he is in a revivary position with Saudi Arabia, Morocco. Iran in the Balkans and all around the world. But at the same time, he knows very well how Islam can something, our religion, something can be convertible to a popular vote or a popularity all around the world. We just was the last sentences about that. I was I was in uh, Skopje uh, during the presidential constitutional referendum in 2000, uh, 2017, 16, uh, 16th of April, 2017. And after Erdogan's victory, you know, the in the North Macedonia, the in the capital in Skopje, the river divided the city into two pieces. And I know it's not academically correct, but these two pieces is definitely different sociopolitical regions. One is Orthodox, quite rich, the other one is Muslim, quite coming from a lower class, so on and so forth. In the Muslim part of the city, there were celebrations, demonstrations for Erdogan and these people celebrating that. Islam is the winner of this constitution. The, 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 the main winner of this election, this constitution referendum is Islam and Erdogan is holding this flag. But at the same time, Erdogan using all of these people to, to create a kind of a transnational popularity and at the same time, transnational repression all around the world. So yes, the answer is yes and no. Islam is both an objection, an objective, and also an instrument for 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 this new regime. Wow! I mean that that intersection of religion and power is fascinating. In the book, you identify one of the key points for President Erdogan and the Justice and Development Party as being late 2013, in terms of the mobilization of religion, and I'm wondering. Is that because of the changes which we're seeing in the Middle East and North Africa, in Arab and Islamic states with mass risings? Is it because of what's happening inside Turkey? We've just come out of large protests, the Gezi Park protest in many Turkish cities. Uh, we have the split between President Erdogan and his religious allies of the, of the Gulenist movement. It, are there any one of these factors that lead to that change in 2013, or is it an intersection of all of them? Intersection of all of them. One of the arguments of book is that the level of intersectionality has reached its peak point. The level of intersectionality between domestic politics and foreign policy has reached its peak point under the uh, Justice and Development Party periods. In not 2014, we started to see all of the evidence of all of these transformation in late 2014, but the transformation, illiberalization, instrumentalization of overdose use of Islam in the region and in domestic politics, they've been gradually increased starting from 2010, maybe 2008. And then we saw the visibility of all of these transformations in 2014. Yes, the one, Indicator is the interest-based, not conflict, it was a war. War between Gülen and Erdogan, very interest-based, very power-oriented war. And this war affected Turkey's both domestic political landscape and also foreign policy. Because Gülen movement was, if, if, if we can speak about in particular for the Balkans, it's a very influential, very giant movement in, for the region. I mean, many schools, many businessmen associations, News, newspaper outlets, so on and so forth. And Erdogan has used Islam, and the Gulenist also used Islam to claim themselves being a non proper Muslim. Therefore, Erdogan and also the Gulenist showed their Muslim faces. This is the first reason. The second reason is that, I mean, we know that 
the Muslim Brotherhood and the Justice and Development Party or the welfare, uh, the, the, the national outlook movement has a great co cooperation in 1980s, 19, beginning of 1990s. And after Arab uprisings, National uh, Justice and Development Party and the Muslim Brotherhood created another, uh, another informal coalition. And this informal coalition has been still existing in Istanbul. There are 30,000 uh, migrants, Muslim Brotherhood migrants in Istanbul and their other diasporas in Europe has been working for, not for Erdogan, but working for the similar objectives. This is the second part. The other part is that Erdogan realized that after Gülen movement, the new coalitional partners of Erdogan, Eurasianists, Islamists, and the nationalists, is not very fun for uh, is not very fun of for for Turkey to be very much Western ally, very much pro Israel. So we saw a shift, a dramatic shift within the state identity, first state behavior, and now it's becoming a state identity. And within this shift. What we saw that the dramatic shift in the Balkans and this shift is not very much, uh, I would define it a Turkish Islamic synthesis, but it is an Islamic Turkish synthesis. The, the level of Islam is much more higher than the level of ethnic uh, or the Turkic oriented policies. Then what effect, if any, does 2016, specifically the failed coup of 2016, have on these calculations over religion? Does it reinforce the effort to use religion as an instrument of power? Or in some way is that complicated and even constrained given of course that Erdogan blames the Gulenist movement as being behind that coup? Even though currently as of 2021, the war between Gulen movement and the AKP seems to be over inside Turkey and the winner is obvious. I wouldn't say the same thing for the Balkans. The war is still continuing because the Gulen movement has a huge links, ties, relations with the state elites in the region. And at the same time, Erdogan is a big, not an external, but an international actor for the region. So after 2016, I mean, we know what happened. The, the Gulenists in Kosovo, they kidnapped by the Turkish intelligence service. We know what happened. Their schools, their, their, their institutions in North Macedonia, they shut down by the force of Turkish uh, governments. But they are still very powerful in Albania. They are still quite powerful in Slovenia. There are some schools in Serbia, despite every good relations uh, between Vucic and Erdogan. These relations is very much, or the Balkans' reactions is very much based on the hierarchies and the Balkan nations, uh, Balkan nations' uh, sovereignty understanding. But one point is quite obvious, not maybe Islam, but after 2016, we saw a new chapter regarding Turkey and the Balkan relations, which is the exportation of domestic conflicts via transnational institutions. I mean, this part of my book actually, or my readings is mostly about the conflict between Gulen movement and AKP. And I mean, the Turkey, even though with all these coup claims, all the evidences, so on and so forth, seems to be the powerful power seems to be the power hand regarding that situation but over those use of authoritarian tendencies and some of the activities of some of the transnational approaches which are beyond their limits beyond their legal uh, borders been getting some problems uh, regarding turkey's activities in the balkans because the Balkan countries after Yugoslavia or after Ottoman Empire and then after Yugoslavia, they very much want to keep their sovereignty. And this, all of these, you should shut down the universities, you should shut down the schools, you should send back these residence permit holders to my country or doing some other backstage activities is very much disturbing some of the mostly non-Muslim political elites in the region has been disturbing a lot. So this is another issue. Indeed, religion is one of the part of this issue because imams have been playing a big role. And there is also a competition regarding the, the umbrella, Islamic umbrella institutions in the Balkans. Who are going to control these institutions? Locals? Gulenists? 
or pro Erdogan's. I mean, for example, the competition for the Albanian uh, Islamic umbrella organization is a uh, fascinating. I mean, they've been changing the uh, head of uh, head, head imam uh, in every single two years. But at the end of the day, the Gulenis reached the position because they have been active in the region more than 30 years. And this gives them a huge human capital that Erdogan doesn't have in the, for, the, for, the, for that country. But the situation in North Macedonia is quite different. And I would say that Erdogan is seems to be the most dominant and the hegemonic actor among the Muslims. This is all based on the state hierarchies. Therefore, one of the titles, I mean, the three components of the book is power. I mean, power is super important to understand all of these issues. Yes, normative parts, history, emotions, nostalgia, that's fine. But at the end of the day, uh, I think I read the, all of these stories quite from a, quite a realistic perspective. Let's talk about that power because and, and looking at the Balkans and beyond, because there are sort of competing arguments here about religion and power and how effective Erdogan has been. One part which you sort of spelled out is, is the possibility of expanding influence in a place like North Macedonia. But we could think beyond that across maybe the Middle East and North Africa in recent years. The other argument is, is that by making that power play, Erdogan's actually isolated himself in Turkey. So, for example, you mentioned the competition with the Gulenist movement, which is still in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, you've got this competition with Saudi Arabia, which has its own form of state organized religion that it projects. We saw this, of course, with the split in the Gulf states, Turkey back in Qatar, Saudi Arabia and UAE on the other side. We have had questions about whether Turkey isolated itself in Syria, that even if it has a sphere of influence with Islamists there, that it caught a flash, you know, people supporting supposedly extreme factions. Is it one or the other? Has, has Erdogan overreached in this use of religion? I mean, this is not an easy question, actually. And the answer, there is not a certain answer regarding that issue, yes or no. Indeed, there are some transformation in Turkish foreign policy, militarization, overdose, over, over, overuse of the hard power instead of sword power, not eligible to be a sharp power, so on and so forth. And Islam and using Islam is one of the new elements of the new Turkey's new foreign policy. I wouldn't say that Erdogan has reached its limits because, I mean, one of the reports that I wrote around a year ago for Brooking Institute, and I made some research and with the Google Maps, what I saw that in Cuba, there were two mosques in Havana. In the main street of Havana, even though the Muslim population is 0.01, when you calculate the all over the population, there are two mosques. One is the Saudi mosques, and exactly the opposite side, there is a Turkish mosque, most probably during the Friday sermons, there are five people over there and five people over there, that's all. But this competition is quite valid in the Balkans and in continental Europe, not in the UK, not in the United States, but in the continental Europe because and the, in the Balkans, because within these countries, due to the many different, many different factors, Muslims couldn't reach the power position couldn't easily reach the economic wealth, couldn't reach any other resources, state resources easily because of the problematic social justice understanding and the particularly after 2010 increasing right-wing populist political ideologies all around the continental Europe and the world. And therefore Erdogan has a kind of a presence on the Muslim street of Europe. It, it, whether it's a Southeast Europe or a, a Western Europe. Erdogan has a relevance. For example, during the earthquake in Albania in 2016, when I talked with the Orthodox Albanians and I, why not talk to the Muslim Albanians, and it's the same for other national issues in North Macedonia. I mean, their state went to the Orthodox or non-Muslim neighborhoods first and the neighborhoods then the Muslim neighborhoods waited for Erdogan. And they, I mean, in North Macedonia, they told me many different stories. Before Erdogan's aid has reached, we were in a very difficult situation. So Erdogan is, is a sort of a, still has a kind of a reasonable, significant leverage. The other thing is that not only in the Balkans, but also in the Western Europe, most of the Turkey originated mosques 
and also umbrella organizations have been funded by Turkish government with legal agreements. For example, without Turkish support, legal support, most probably in France, it will be very difficult to find imam. Even though the North African uh, Muslims are quite significant in religion. For example, without Turkish 1 billion euro in every single year, you can't see any uh, Grand Mifti office or any imam or any restorate clean mosques in Bulgaria. So whose fault is that? Bulgarian states or Turkey states? So, I mean, there is a lack of serving ability of these European or Saudi European countries. And there is a gap within this situation and Erdogan easily fill that gap. And it is activities while filling that gap, it's the big question mark. I have a sense that this time next year, I might be inviting you back on and we'll still be discussing President Erdogan. Definitely. <laughs> and what is happening inside Turkey and beyond. Uh, but for now, uh, Dr. Ferdi Ozturk, let me thank you. Let me thank you for the book, Religion, Identity and Power, published by Edinburgh University Press. Let me thank the great team of Deep Dive Politics for putting us on air. And most of all, let me th thank you, viewers, for joining me in learning and hopefully understanding a little bit more about our world. Uh, you can find out more about Deep Dive Politics by going to our Facebook page, by going to dive underscore politics on Twitter. All of our broadcasts are also podcast on Spotify and of course, you can see not only this video, but all the others in the series on YouTube. So thank you all once again. We'll be back very soon with another look across the world. But for now, stay safe, stay sane, be decent to each other. Scott Lucas, this has been World Unfiltered.